we've got high cortisol, high ghrelin, low leptin, low metabolism. Oh, but wait, it gets even worse because here's what ends up happening is you end up having cravings for high fat, high carbohydrate foods. Why on earth would you have those? Because your brain doesn't like all this cortisol that's working its way around. And so it wants serotonin to come in and calm your brain down. The easiest way to get serotonin into your brain is to eat high sugar, high fat, high caloric foods. Dr. Michael Bruce, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. I've been studying you from quite some time, and I love the work that you're doing. I was just telling you off air how much I admire your drive and the work that you're doing, and we'll talk all about that. I definitely want to talk about the things you're doing, but sure. before we do, please share your story with us, with our audi my audience, how you got involved with what you're doing today. So it wasn't like I woke up, you know, in college and said, hey, I want to be a sleep doctor, right? Like that just didn't happen. So it was actually very serendipitous. So for folks out there who are looking for drive and motivation and think that they know what their goals are, I'm here to tell you that life shifts things around quite a bit. And some days you end up in spaces that you never would have imagined. So my goal, I was in graduate school getting a PhD in clinical psychology, and I was interested in sports psych. So I wanted to work with athletes and help them, you know, throw harder and run faster and do all those cool athletic things and work with teams. And, and I was into sports and I thought that would be awesome. And in clinical psychology, there's a residency program and um, you have to do one year at another institution. And then there are rotations within that residency. Well, the, the best residency for sports psych, believe it or not, was in Jackson, Mississippi um, for what I was interested in. Um, and I was interested in eating disorders and athletes, and there was a great program there. But to be fair, only the Harvards and the Princetons and the Yales, you know, got in. I, I went to the University of Georgia, top 20 program, but it's not Harvard. And um, they were like, nope, you know, it's probably not going to happen for you. But they had a sleep track um, where they were looking for somebody who was interested in sleep. And I had worked my way through graduate school uh, with all of those machines. So I worked in the electrophysiology department. And so I can take apart machines, put them back together. Anything that runs a signal from the body, that's kind of where my wheelhouse is and what I was interested in playing around with. Well, it turns out that the sleep machines are exactly that. And so they decided to take me on only under the guise of the sleep specialization um, because they were like, well, he's already trained up. It'll be, it'll be easy to get him into the rotation and get him going. And so my goal was just to get in because I figured once I got there, I'd just transfer, right? I'd just transfer over to the sports psych department. And because just because you tell me I can't be in your program doesn't mean I'm not going to be in your program. It just means you don't think I'm going to be in your program. Um, and uh, started, uh, got in, got to Jackson and um, started out in the sleep track. And by the third day, I absolutely fell in love with clinical sleep medicine. And I knew that was where I was going to spend my entire career. Dude, I help people like this. It's unbelievable. Like sleep is such a fundamental aspect of every single part of your health that like when I had that opportunity and I realized what a sleep specialist actually does, like it's crazy. Like, I mean, you change your sleep, you change your life. Like that is just kind of the bottom line for me. And there's so many simple, simple ways for people to do that. I really started to get more interested in it. So I finished the program and uh, got my first job. And I was managing a sleep laboratory in Decatur, Georgia, which is just outside Atlanta. And um, over the course of about six or seven years, we grew from one four-bed lab to uh, four four-bed labs. So we had a pretty decent volume. We were the largest uh, privately owned sleep laboratory in the state of Georgia, owned by physicians. Um, and I, I managed it and ran all the medicine and the technologists and read all the studies and did all that kind of fun stuff. And then um, I got asked to move across the country and do a what's called a roll up. So there was a group that wanted to buy sleep laboratories across all the United States and create one great big entity because you can get economies of scale and things like that. So I went from being super duper medicine only to business and medicine. So I was still seeing patients with this group, moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. But the goal was to buy sleep laboratories. Um, and um, over the course of time, we, we bought several. Um, the, unfortunately, the business didn't end up going well. And I ended up um, writing my first book during that period of time. And I got on the Oprah Winfrey show in 2004. And um, things worked well. Um, you know, I didn't have the Oprah effect per se, but 
a lot of people really started to think about sleep in a different way. And I started to get a lot more media attention. And I've been running and gunning, you know, for literally 20 years um, with this. But my, my area of specialty is not uh, the same as many sleep doctors out there. When you, when you talk about sleep doctors, many people think about apnea, right, or snoring, because that's really the main function, right? They're mostly pulmonologists and they're fixing snoring or sleep apnea. Um, I can do that. I've done that for years, but that wasn't really my, my purview. What I discovered over the course of probably the last six or seven years is there are sleep disorders, right? Apnea, narcolepsy, formal insomnia, restless leg syndrome, diagnosable situations. And then there's what I call disordered sleep, right? So it's like, I went into that room in the back of the house. I got six, I got seven, I got eight hours, whatever my number is. And I feel like crap. Why? That's the question that I've been trying to answer for the last probably seven to eight years. And I think I've got some good handles on that. And that's where my research has been. That's where my most recent book, The Power of When, talking about the chronotypes. And I'm sure we'll talk about that soon. So like, that's really what happened for me was this sort of evolution from pure straight up clinical psychology, sports psych into sleep. And then this, this career in sleep has really morphed or evolved, I guess is probably a better word into me being able to tr try to figure out like, how can I help the largest group of people? Because there's more people out there with disordered sleep than there are with sleep disorders for sure. Um, and so I've really dedicated my life, my career, my, my learnings to really understanding that disordered sleep universe and trying to, trying to help people feel better. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. And, and I mentioned to you before we hopped on here that you are a man on a mission and you just expressed why you're on that mission. You, <laughs> there's so many people out there with disordered sleep. I right. see it all the time and you're so right. Sleep is foundational. I tell people all the time, and you're going to love this. I said, hey, sleep is more important than nutrition and exercise combined because yes. you could go days with, or weeks without food, weeks yep. without exercise, but you can't yep. go weeks without sleep. You turn into no. a crazy person. Yeah. So it's so funny that you say that, Ben, because here's what I tell people all the time. I do it a little bit in reverse. So what I tell people is you can go with air for about six minutes max, and you really have to try. You can go for without water for about four days, but it is dangerous. You can go for without food for like 30 days. You can go without exercise. Let's be honest, an, an entire lifetime. There are many people out there that have never exercised. You can only go about six days without sleep. And let me tell you something, it is ugly when you get to that sixth day. You're hallucinating, you're, I mean, it's a mess. You know, like that has to be under extremely controlled conditions. And so when I stack them all up, there's no question that sleep is, is more important than diet and exercise. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't look at it in, as the level of, this is more important than this. I'm more like, dude, we've got to get it all working straight. Cause like, we only have one of these, you know, these contraptions called our bodies and we want to keep it in good shape and we want it to last for a long time. And so if you're like me, I'm 51 years old and, um, you know, I'm all about my health. Like, how do I get healthier? How do I feel better? How do I have less pain? How do I live longer? How do I just have a good time while I'm here? And sleep, I think you use the word and I think it's the right word to use. It's fundamental to our overall human experience. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And you're right, because we're not saying to neglect exercise and nutrition. Those are also pieces no, of the puzzle. But we're saying that this is the key piece to that puzzle sleep is. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, the, the, you could go 382 days without food. That was the Guinness World Record. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, it's a, oh, it's a 382 days. Yeah, I wrote about him in my fasting book, Morbidly Obese Scotsman. He went from 450 pounds to 180 pounds, just water, medically supervised. Yeah, for 382 days. And he lost and he went from 450 to 180. That's amazing. I know. Yeah, wow. it's incredible. Very extreme. That is incredible. I had no idea. Okay, now I'm going to add, uh, you've added to my, uh, to my storytelling. I love it. Thanks, It makes man. your story even more powerful because uh, it no goes question. from 30 to 382. Um, I want to get into sleep for sure in your book. But before I do, there's a quote that I heard you say on a podcast actually recently. And oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it here. And I'd love for you to just uh, expand upon this quote. You so bet. quote, I like having hurdles in my life. When life was easy, I don't learn nearly as much. The process of growth involves destruction. Yes. Yeah. So, so, when you, so what I meant by this is any type of growth, right? So let's look at it not in a human form. Let's look at it just cellular and plant life, right? So for a plant to go from this big to this big, 
it literally has to destroy itself. All the fibers and all the connections and, and all the, the infrastructure of the plant literally has to, has to be crushed, rejumbled, and then reformed to get bigger, to get bigger, to get bigger. So growth is a painful process. Growth is a destructive process. And if you don't, if, if you're just humming along and everything's great and you don't have any of those growth challenges, you ain't growing. Like there's no question in my mind, it just does not work that way. And so that's kind of where that, that aspect comes from with me anyway, is if you wanna grow, you have to understand that growth is destruction. And once you get that in your head and you start to understand that as a philosophy, everything gets a lot easier. That's beautiful. Yeah, you, you shift your mindset from in the way to on the way. And that's exactly yes. what you just explained. So great. I love that. Okay, let's talk about sleep. You know, what I want to yes. start with is a lot of my listeners and viewers, the keto campers, the amazing keto campers, they come to me and they say, I want to lose 10 pounds, 100 right. pounds. They want to lose a specific amount of weight. And I tell them, okay, let's get healthy to lose weight, not lose weight to get healthy. And let's focus on the hormones. And one of the biggest impacts on the hormones is, is sleep. sleep. So what's the relationship between hormones, sleep, and fat loss? Absolutely. So in my second book, which was called The Sleep Doctor's Diet, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep, I give a very lengthy explanation of this, but I'm going to condense that to only a couple of minutes here so that way people can kind of understand it. But what we've discovered is, is there's really four different hormonal things that happen when a, a human body becomes sleep deprived. So let's first unpack that notion of sleep deprivation before we start talking about hormonal uh, imbalance. So sleep deprivation is different for everybody, right? So Ben, your sleep deprivation and my sleep deprivation could be miles and miles apart. As, as an example, I go to bed around midnight. I get up right at between 6 and 6.13 every day for some crazy reason. I don't know why. So if, if I would be sleep deprived if I got five and a half hours of sleep, okay? You, on the other hand, may have a completely different schedule. You might go to bed at 11 and wake up at at four, let's say, and get five hours and feel fantastic. So then you would need less than that to be sleep deprived. So the sleep deprivation, I think what we need to say is it's a personalized situation. So if you feel sleep deprived, if you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm dragging ass, I wanna hit the snooze button, I wanna stay in bed longer, then you're sleep deprived, right? A Couple of other key indicators. If you fall asleep within five minutes of your head hitting the pillow, that's not good. That's actually sleep deprivation right there. It should be a 10 to 15 minute process for your body to chill, relax, and kind of slow your heart rate down and get there, right? Um, other things is, again, hitting that snooze button more than once or twice, actually more than once, and you probably are sleep deprived. Then the irregularity of that bedtime can cause a lot of sleep deprivation as well. So figure out what your definition of sleep deprivation is first. Now let's talk about what happens when this body is sleep deprived hormonally and how does that affect weight gain or the lack of weight loss. So when a body is sleep deprived, and by the way, this is all uh, highly documented in research by Dr. Ev Coulter out of the University of Chicago. Um, she's, I mean, her, her extensive work in this is phenomenal. Um, I um, paraphrased and um, really dug into and reviewed all of that literature in my book, uh, The Sleep Doctor's Diet. So if that's something that people wanna check out, for sure, check it out. But here's what we know, is when the body is sleep deprived, lots of things happen. Number one, sleep deprivation leads to a cortisol increase, right? So the more sleep deprived you are, your body is like, why am I awake? I shouldn't be awake right now. Something bad must be going on. Increase cortisol, so I've got my fight or flight going. So if I need to get out of here, I can get out of here. Remember, this is very primal internally. It's not necessarily a logical thing that we're kind of thinking about. So number one, cortisol goes up. Cortisol is not healthy for sleep. Let's just be very, very clear, right? Cortisol is an activating hormone like adrenaline or something like that. You want cortisol low before bed. Well, when you're sleep deprived, it jacks up and it stays high. When you have cortisol that stays high, there's lots of bad things that go on from that. Everything from adrenal fatigue um, to hormonal imbalance. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? So being careful about where your cortisol is, is going to be important. The second thing that happens is your metabolism drops. Why? Well, because you're, oh, and let me go back. The cortisol is high and it increases your appetite. Why? To get resources in, okay? It's telling you, hey, you're up and you're around, you need food. Not necessarily true, by the way, but this is what your hormones are doing inside this chemistry set that we call your skull, right? 
So all of a sudden you've got high appetite. The second thing that happens, metabolism dumps. Why? Again, to reserve resources. Your brain is saying, I'm up. I got it. I've only got a certain amount of fuel in the tank. I better slow my body down. I better slow my engine down, if you will, so that I'm not, I don't use all that up because I only have a finite amount. So we're already in a bad situation, right? Because we've got appetite high and metabolism low. So right there, we know that's an opportunity for weight gain, but it gets much worse. So as you continue to get sleep deprived, there are two hormones in particular that play a big role. One is called ghrelin and the other is called leptin. So ghrelin, which starts with a G, I think of it as the go hormone. That's how I remember it. This is, increases hunger. Yes, appetite and hunger turn out to be two completely different things inside your brain from a hormonal standpoint. So your appetite is already high, now your hunger increases. So ghrelin increases by almost 20%. Leptin, which is the hormone of what we call satiety, it makes you feel full, that actually decreases by 15%. So we've got high cortisol, high ghrelin, low leptin, low metabolism. Overweight, it gets even worse. Because here's what ends up happening is you end up having cravings for high fat, high carbohydrate foods. Why on earth would you have those? Because your brain doesn't like all this cortisol that's working its way around. And so it wants serotonin to come in and calm your brain down. The easiest way to get serotonin into your brain is to eat high sugar, high fat, high caloric foods right? And so your brain actually craves it. This is actually why we call them comfort foods. They make us feel comfortable, right? This is not a place to feel comfortable, right? So here at the end of the day are the things that are just screwing it up for everybody is number one, you're sleep deprived, high appetite, sleep deprived, ghrelin high. So you've got high appetite and high hunger. Number two, your leptin is low. So you don't ever feel full and um, your metabolism is low. And then finally, you're just gonna eat anything that you can get your hands on because it's gonna lower that cortisol and help increase that level of serotonin. So what's the easiest solution to all of this situation? Don't be sleep deprived, right? Like if this isn't rocket science, guys. Like there are absolutely positively ways to figure out how much sleep you need so that you don't get sleep deprived and you can actually avoid all of this. I would argue, and I've, I've argued this on television for years, any diet, any diet, whether it's keto, whether it's paleo, whether you're a vegan, you're a vegetarian, a intermittent fat, I don't care. If you're not sleeping, it's not going to work effectively. Period. End of story. Does that make sense? Amen. I'm with you, Michael. I, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I think it's such uh, people, too many people sleep on sleep. <laughs> That's yeah, the only exactly. sleep they get is when they sleep on sleep. And also, you didn't even mention this, but cortisol and melatonin have that inverted relationship, yes, right? absolutely. Thank so you. how important is melatonin and what does that happen with cortisol there? So that's, thank you for reminding me about that, Ben. So when cortisol is high, melatonin is low. That's just how the brain wants to work. Remember, everybody, melatonin is that key that starts the engine for sleep. It's not the only thing that you need, but you cannot actually start the sleeping process without melatonin being active and on board. And when you've got high levels of cortisol, again, because of that sleep deprivation, it's just this repetitive cycle and your brain is like, hell no, I don't want melatonin. Something's about to happen. There's a reason that I'm awake. So remember guys, there's two distinct systems in the brain for sleep. One is sleep drive, the other is sleep rhythm. Sleep drive is an accumulation of something called adenosine. So when a cell eats a piece of glucose, something comes out the back end. One of those things is adenosine works its way through your system and hits very specific receptor sites in your brain, and it accumulates over time. That accumulation is you feeling sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. But that's only one aspect of sleep. The second one is your circadian rhythm. This is where melatonin comes in. So melatonin follows your core body temperature rhythm. So our core body temperature um, stays at a pretty consistent spot and then starts to climb in the, once we get into the early evening. At around 10.30, it hits this peak, and then it crests, and then it starts to go down. When it crests over, that's a signal to the brain to release melatonin. So this is one of the reasons why my, part of my recommendations are be careful exercising too close to bedtime because you're gonna increase all that core body temperature. Your temperature can't drop, which can't release melatonin, which can't allow the process of sleep to start. So when we're looking at the relationship of melatonin to sleep, it is primal. Like you cannot sleep without melatonin on board. Now this becomes an issue for some people, for example, if they have jet lag right? So a classic example is I live in California and um, I'm flying to London, uh, which is actually occurring next week. I have to go to London. And so that's a 12 hour flight. So my melatonin rhythm doesn't know I'm going on a 12 hour flight. So I'm going to have to either take 
um, exogenous or external melatonin, or I'm gonna have to use light therapy to push my circadian rhythm in the direction that I want it to be in. So melatonin turns out to be, I would argue, the most critical hormone for sleep. But also to be fair, most people have plenty of melatonin on board. So there's a lot of people out there who use melatonin as a supplement. Here's the thing, very rarely would you actually have a melatonin deficiency or would you need to have melatonin on board other than a situation like jet lag. There's two situations that I wanna remind people about where melatonin absolutely positively is probably gonna be something that you'd use every night. Uh, one is in people over age about 50, 55, when we see a melatonin uh, decline in terms of production. So when you hit about 50, 55, many people, their melatonin production begins to slow down. So that's one of the first things that I check on people is, hey, you know, uh, we do a saliva test, we figure out where their melatonin is, because I need to know, do I need to put them on melatonin as a supplement or not? The second group of people is um, autistic children. So there's a lot of data, and by the way, high doses of melatonin in this group of kids. Um, we're talking three, four, five milligrams. And you might be saying, hold on a second, why is he saying that three or four or five milligrams is high? Because the appropriate dose of melatonin is between a half and one and a half milligrams. Did you know that 95% of melatonin is sold in an over dosage format? 95% of it is sold in three, fives, even 10 milligrams. When you take 10 milligrams of melatonin, you're almost assuredly gonna get side effect profiles of crazy dreams. And it, in some cases, it's been shown to affect high blood pressure medication. And remember, mm. melatonin is a circadian shifter and your body works on a circadian system. So if you're taking a ton of melatonin on a regular basis, it's not a good idea. Also, cautionary, I do not uh, recommend melatonin in kids, especially girls under the age of 18, because at high dosages, it's actually a contraceptive. Uh, many people don't know that, but in Europe, it's actually prescribed only. You can't just walk into the local health food store and buy melatonin, and it's uh, used as a contraceptive. So again, I can't think of anything worse than putting a contraceptive in a young female developing body before it's either necessary because of some other issue or before um, they, they reach 18 where they've actually finished their development um, almost. So at the end of the day, is melatonin important? You bet. But most, most, most people have got enough of it inside where they really shouldn't need external melatonin. Sorry, I kind of got on my soapbox there. Yeah, I love it, man. There's so much I want to ask you. I mean, that was a great explanation of what melatonin does. It's a hormone and an antioxidant. And, yes. and like you said, so many people are overdosing with it because it's available over the counter. Right. And, and it's a hormone. So you also want to be very diligent with the type <laughs> and brand you're using if you do Absolutely. choose to use it. I see people with a lot of stomach bugs, um, gut dys dysbiosis, have low melatonin. And when I, yeah, when I help when, and when I fix their leaky gut, I see melatonin go back up on, on like a Dutch test. Um, yeah. so I've seen that with, with working with some people, I have a question for you. This is kind of a personal selfish question that I wanted to get your take on. So I, it's just so strange. Typically when I lie down at night and I put my head on the pillow, a lot of the times I would say three out of the seven days of the week, I would remember some of my dreams from the night before. And it happens as soon as I lie down and, and hit my head on the pillow, I start remembering dreams from the night before. And it happens very often. Do you, have you ever heard about that or know what's going on? So that, so if I had to guess, so no, I haven't heard about that before, but I don't think that's a completely unusual thing. Um, my guess is, is that you've classically conditioned yourself over a course of time. So the environment, and when you literally put your head on the pillow, you're in that position, and then your brain immediately goes to that cognition. Like, oh, I'm asleep, I'm, I'm going to be dreaming, and then you start to remember those dreams. Um, it doesn't sound like, I mean, certainly doesn't sound like anything harmful. Um, I have not heard about people telling me that, mostly what people tell me when they lie down is it's all about their day. So what did I do today? What did I say today? Where did I go today? Did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? What do I need to do tomorrow, right? And so that's really where people have a tendency to focus. Um, but I would probably bet that if you did a little uh, work with yourself in terms of, hey, I'm, I'm interested in my dreams, I wanna learn more about my dreams, and I really wanna think about my dreams, the way dreaming works is it has a lot to do with intent. So you could actually pick up the next chapter of your dream, I would guess, by doing what you do. So if you laid there and really manifested and really thought through, hey, this is what I dreamt last night, as you're kind of, working your body down and closing it down and, and started getting there, I'd be willing to bet you'd probably get pretty close to that dream again and or the next 
phase or the next chapter in that dream. Because we, we dream like chapters in a book. It's so fascinating. Yeah, I think you're right when you said it's kind of like my conditioning. My head hits the pillow and I'm kind of in that zone. I do have a very nighttime, uh, a routine structure at night where I make sure I'm doing my routine and I'm getting ready for bed. Good. So I'm, I, and, I, and I fall that to the T. And for me, 10.30 p.m. is my, my nighttime routine and uh, it works really good for me, my schedule. H how bad is it? And I've talked about this before, but I want to hear your thoughts on it. How sure. bad is it to eat a big meal right before bed? So I don't have a problem with it, but I'll tell you why. Um, I'm a night owl or what I call a wolf. And so my metabolism doesn't really, I like, I do intermittent fasting um, and I definitely am uh, more on the animal protein, plant protein side, sort of the keto side of, of life. And um, what I've discovered is that if I can, I eat my, I, my biggest meal I eat is usually around 7.30, 8 o'clock. You know, and like I said, I'm, I, but I don't go to bed until midnight. So I think number one, it depends. Well, that's upon not what I mean, though. I mean, right. like, let's say you ate at 11 and went to sleep at 1130. Ah, I see. So here's what I can tell you. It depends on what you eat as terms of the sleep that you're going to get. Right. So if you go and you have, you know, chips and salsa and guacamole and pour on the hot sauce, it's not going to be a good night. Right. Um, the data is very consistent. Like we were talking about before, car carbohydrates make you feel sleepy. So if you eat a big carbohydrate uh, meal uh, right before bed, it will absolutely make you feel tired. Um, to be fair, I have um, like my uh, nighttime snack when I tell patients who like, let's say they eat their main meal at 6.30, 7 o'clock, but they're not going to bed till midnight. Um, they wake up in the middle of the night hungry. Um, and so one of the things we use is there's a couple of different things. So one is just a snack. So I usually recommend about a 250 calorie snack. Um, usually about 70% carbs, about 30% uh, protein or fat, because that increased carbohydrates is going to increase that level of serotonin and calm you down and make you fall asleep. Um, or I use something called guava leaf tea. So guava leaf tea is very interesting. Not guava fruit and not guava juice, but guava leaf tea. Um, I, there's at least one study to show that it actually keeps your blood sugar stable throughout the night. Because one of the biggest problems that I hear people is, Michael, I'm doing all this stuff, it's working great, but I still wake up in the middle of the night, what's going on? And I, oftentimes I'm like, when was your last meal? And they say, oh, seven o'clock. And I'm like, what time are you waking up? And they say, you know, three o'clock in the morning. If you do the math, that's eight hours, right? They're out of fuel, right? And so I get it, our body doesn't always need to have fuel in it, but during sleep, most people don't know this, you use as much glucose during REM sleep as you almost do when you're awake. Right, because yeah. you're dreaming, and this is a very fantastical thing, and all this kind of glucose is necessary to get all that stuff going in your dreams. So you definitely use food. Um, so I would say that if you are a late chronotype like me, um, and you are careful about what you eat, then it's probably just fine to have a, a later snack. But you really don't want to go over probably 250, 350 calories because you know once you fall asleep, your whole metabolism slows down. That's going to turn into fat, um, and you better have a really good exercise routine the next day or understand, you know, really where you're at the next day in terms of if you're a faster or a keto or whatever you do. Does yeah. Make sense? Yeah. It makes sense. It makes total sense. Thank you for breaking that down. Now sure. I didn't, I never heard about the guava leaf tea. Is that what you said? Yep. Guava leaf tea. There's another tea that I talk about all the time and I always credit you because I heard it from you first, which is banana tea. Yep. Um, talk Big magnesium bit. guy. Yeah. I love banana more. tea. Yeah. So to, to share with everybody, if they haven't already heard you talk about it, Magnesium actually controls over 300 functions in our body. It's crazy. Um, but yet we don't, our body doesn't produce magnesium. We have to eat it. Um, and unfortunately, the soil in the U.S. and a lot of places where we get our food from, it's overtilled and it just doesn't have the minerals and the nutrients that we need. And so even if you ate a bushel of kale every day, you still might, I mean, that would be gross, but you still might not get the magnesium that you're looking for. And so banana tea is a great way to do that. So you just take an organic banana, wash it off, cut off the tip and the stem, cut it in half, leave the fruit in and the peel on it, put it in about three cups of water, boil it till it's brown and drink the water. Um, it's very banana-y, um, as my daughter likes to say. So you gotta like bananas, um, but it's loaded with magnesium. And it's super safe to give to um, seniors to give to kids, uh, people on medication. Like you don't have to worry about interaction effects or things. I mean, it's just a banana, you know, it's just yeah. boiled banana water. 
Um, but it really works uh, quite well. What was, what's been your experience, Ben, with banana seed? Yeah, it works quite well. And even if you're doing keto, it's not going to raise your blood sugar because you're not eating the fruit. Um, so for me, yeah. I love it. I actually, I use the banana tea and I'll put some reishi mushroom extract in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it calms me down. So I love it. I've seen it work wonders, amazing for some people. Some people say they didn't, they didn't really feel it, but for yeah. most, they did notice a positive effect. And personally, I'm one of those people. So great tip, yeah. but I share it all the time. Well, and also the ritual is, is important. So people don't under, like, and the intent is important. You know, I guess that's one of the things I definitely want to get across to your listeners is sleep is a lot like love. The less you look for it, the more it shows up, right? So if you're that person where sleep, 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 I've got to fix my sleep. I got to, it's not going to work very well, right? But if you can really chill, really relax and have the intent, the positive intent to sleep, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I have people do. Like as an example, all the time, instead of doing a worry journal before bed, I have people do a gratitude list, right? Because it's positive. It's, there's actually data, believe it or not, to show that if you're thinking about positive thoughts before bed, you actually have better dreams mm. um, and deeper sleep. So I'm all about positivity, right? 2020 is the year of the positive. So I want people with the intent to say, hey, I'm going to lie down. I'm going to uh, you know, do my best to get a, to get a good night's sleep. And whatever happens, it's going to be fine because I've always got the next night or the next night. And just don't focus on the negative side of sleep, focusing on the positive side of sleep. Perfect example is when you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you look at the clock, right? Because everybody does. Everybody, I mean, even if I tell you not to, if I tell you to remove the clock, everybody still looks at the clock. And they instantly do the mental math, right? And they're like, oh, shit, I, it's 3.30. I got to be up at six. I only have two and a half hours more sleep. Sleep sleep, sleep, you know, and they try really hard. So first of all, all that autonomic arousal, you're never going to fall asleep, right? You've literally turned on the sympathetic nervous system at that point, which is the opposite of what you want to do. You want the parasympathetic nervous system to be on. And so when you look at the clock, instead of saying, oh shit, say, awesome, I've got two and a half hours to catch some more Z's. Who knows what's going to happen? I'm going to chill out here and relax and just let my body get reinvigorated. And more, more times than not, that's like the not looking for love thing. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're out. You know, like it's unbelievable. But intent for sleep turns out to be one of the most critical unknown factors out there. Yeah, I love that. I, I'm a big fan of gratitude. I have notebooks after notebooks for the last uh, three or four years. I've been writing it every single night with my goals. Me and my girlfriend, we have our, our pads. Awesome. and we, So that's our, our routine. I turn off my phone. It's on airplane mode. It's out of the room. There's no, no stimulations, no getting the heart rate up. Uh, and it's made a big difference for my sleep. I also have been experimenting with, um, with uh, the mouth taping uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for deep sleep. And it's been helping me, at least according to my aura ring, it's been getting a little bit better with uh, the mouth taping. I, uh, what you shared was important because one of my, one of my good friends who's actually been on the podcast. You, are you good? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. One of my good friends who's been on the podcast, he's also a sleep expert. His name is Devin Burke. He's based out of here in South Florida. Mm -hmm. He says a lot of the people who experience insomnia, he works with a lot of people with insomnia, they, they psych themselves out, yeah. like you just mentioned. And it's a lot of their, their thoughts thinking that, oh my God, if they go to sleep now, they're going to get X amount. And right. they just keep psyching themselves out. So I love that. You, you just change that, reframe the mindset. Oh, exactly. awesome. I get two hours or three more hours of sleep. It's, exactly. uh, I love that tip. So let's talk a little bit about your book, uh, The Power of When. You mentioned yeah. chronotype, how to know if you're a night owl. Right. How does somebody determine that? Talk a little bit about that process. Sure. So when we were, when I was writing the book, um, so first of all, let me be very clear. Chronotypes have been around since the 70s, okay? People have known what chronotypes were for a long period of time. And, and that was only when they were first defined. They've been around forever. Um, and let's, let's actually unpack that for just a second. So what is a chronotype? A chronotype is a genetically, in your genes, predetermined sleep schedule that your body wants to do. And this is actually very easy to find. You can go to 23andMe, Ancestry.com. Uh, there are sleep genetic testing services that you can do. You can actually figure out exactly which one you are. Are you an early bird? Are you a night owl? Are you in between? That was the popular vernacular for quite a long period of time. When you look back at it historically, we understand why. So if you went into like the hunter-gatherers world, when somebody, when the group of guys or gals would leave in the morning to go hunt, and I, I would argue back then it was mostly guys, those were the, those are the uh, early birds, right? What I call a lion, right? These were the early people. The people that woke up at, you know, seven, eight o'clock and tended to the village and the kids and the, all that, those were in the middle, 
right? And then the night owls was the security force. They were the sentries, right? They were the people, they were naturally awake anyway, so they were guarding the village. So we've always had these three types of people. My contribution to the literature was adding insomnia um, because there is a genetic form of insomnia. And I, like I do sleep genetic testing on patients all the time. And I, I'm like, yep, you got it. So we need to get everything else in really good shape because genetically speaking, you're just not gonna get good sleep. So I added that fourth characteristic. Now, to be fair, I didn't like the bird terminology, right? I'm a mammal, I'm not a bird. So early birds turn into lions. In the middle, go from what we used to call a hummingbird to a bear. Night owls become a wolf. And then people with insomnia become a dolphin. Now, why did you choose those animals? I actually chose animals that have the actual circadian cycle that's associated with what we're talking about. Um, so lions, first kill is usually before dawn. Um, they are very early morning creatures. Bears, they kind of wake up when the sun comes up and they kind of go to bed when the sun goes down. Uh, wolves, as we all know, are fairly nocturnal creatures. They hunt in packs at night. Um, but a lot of people wonder about dolphins. Like, Michael, why on earth did you do dolphins? So it turns out that dolphins sleep uni-hemispherically. So half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators. And I thought that was kind of an interesting representation of my insomniacs who are just never quite asleep, you know? Um, and how do you figure it out? Well, you can do the genetic testing. There's a much easier way. If you go to my website, chronoquiz.com, we'll put those in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, you can do it for free. Um, it's 30, 40 questions, uh, uh, depending upon which kind of path you end up taking. And uh, you get a full report and you learn exactly what your chronotype is. Now, the real question is, well, what do you do with it, right? Like, okay, so I'm an early bird or I'm a night owl. Why, who cares? Why does that matter? So it's all about hormones. So remember in the beginning of our conversation, we were talking about how hormones affect our sleep. Hormones turn out to be very regular in their patterning, right? So if you're an, let's say you're an early bird and I'm a night owl. When you're an early bird at about six o'clock, 5.30, guess what? Your melatonin shuts off and that allows you to wake up. I'm a night owl. My melatonin doesn't shut off until 8.30, right? So there's a huge disparity. So if I wake up at the time that my early bird friends did, I'm going to feel like crap, right? This is, and by the way, all of your hormones are attached to this one chronotype. So all of your hormones as a night owl or wolf won't kind of kick in until 8, 8.30. And that can make life very, very difficult. And so that's what the book is really about. It's about figuring out your chronotype. It's about understanding what you can and cannot do during a day. Because here's the cool part is since the hormones are so regular, I can show you the perfect time of day based on natural hormone elevation. I can show you the perfect time of day to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise. Like literally you name the function and we've got it in the book. We have, I think there's 50 different activities in the book. So some of them are sports related, some of them are financial, some of them are relationship, um, because all of those aspects are really important, right? I mean, I have a chapter in there on when to talk to your kids. You know, I have a chapter in there on when to have sex. So it's like all of these things are actually hormonally driven events. And once you kind of unlock the key to understand what your, you know, chronotype is and your partner's, Dude, it gets unbelievably better from an efficiency standpoint, from an optimization standpoint, even from a work standpoint. I mean, I had, uh, when I first came out with the book, Dave Asprey of uh, Bulletproof fame, he liked it so much, he had me chronotype his entire company. Wow. Everybody took the quiz. And then he would schedule meetings based on people's chronotypes, right? So night owls didn't have 7 a.m., you know, Monday morning meetings because they're never going to get anything out of it. And it just starts to make sense. And that's what Crona, that's what the book is all about. And so that's really where we went with it was from a personal biohacker health. Um, I just want to learn more about my hormones and my life standpoint. That's kind of what happened. Yeah, that's fascinating. We'll put, we'll definitely put the links for your books and the quiz yeah, in the notes. So Rachel will do that. Rachel's our, our podcast notes person. Um, question mm -hmm. is that your chronotype, which is genetically based, is that yeah. something you could, uh, kind of change, change with, with epigenetics let's say you did let's say because you're a night owl right let's say you just yep. force yourself for three months to wake up early can you can you change that so here's what's interesting because it's genetic there's only so much you can change right so here's what i tell people is wait it out because your chronotype may change on its own right and so when we look at it from an evolutionary standpoint let's take an infant infants are lions they are uh, creatures that go to bed very early and wake up very early 
Then when you have a child and they're in more of the middle school years or the toddler years, they turn into a bear. So they're getting up when the sun comes up, they're going to sleep when the sun goes down, they're getting a decent amount of sleep. Then what happens? They turn into teenagers, right? Anybody out there that has a teenager, I've got two. It sucks, by the way. There's nothing easy about having a teenager. Um, what do they want to do? They want to stay up until two o'clock in the morning and sleep until 12 the next day. So they turn into wolves. Then around age 18, 19, 20, your chronotype seems to set. And it stays that way until you're about 50. And then remember when we were having our discussion about melatonin, I was talking about how melatonin starts to decline after 50. Well, this is why you've got the blue plate special and the early bird specials, right? So when you go into a restaurant and you see a bunch of you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 year olds having dinner at 4.30, why the fuck are they doing that? Well, let me tell you, because their melatonin is actually shortened in, in, in duration and they're only getting it a certain period and it's going earlier. So it actually shifts their entire circadian rhythms where they either become a lion or a dolphin. Um, unfortunately, what happens with a lot of my seniors is they become medically complicated. So there's med medicines on board, there's therapies on board, and that has a tendency to disrupt sleep uh, in different ways as well. And so that's kind of what happens. And so there is a, what we call chrono longevity. So there's a, there's a whole chapter in the book that helps talk people through this delineation across their lifespan of what happens. Believe it or not, there's actually a seasonality to chronotypes as well. So during the winter time, when we don't get as much sunlight um, and the days are shorter, it has a dramatic effect if you're an early bird versus a night owl and things like that as well. So there's all kinds of variations that occur, but it's kind of fun to learn about them and, you know, tweak it out and check it out and, you know, do the experiment on yourself and see what happens. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I'm definitely a bear. The sun goes down and I'm ready to go. <laughs> the sun comes up and I'm ready to wake up. At least right go. now, that's the way it is for me. Okay, we have a few minutes left and I, I got sure. through like half the questions that I had for you. Which, <laughs> then which, I, I got to come back, dude. You got to come back. This is, that's a good sign. That means this conversation has gone great and we've yeah. tried to get together for quite some time. So I'm so grateful for, for, for this conversation. It's been a lot of fun. I have, uh, Michael, my rapid fire segment. Are you ready to do that? I'm ready. Okay. I know you're not per se a keto guy, but what is your favorite keto food if you were to have a keto rich food, high fat food? So here's the thing. Historically, I was never an avocado guy ever. Like I thought, oh, I didn't like the consistency. I didn't like the taste. I didn't like any of that. And my daughter loves avocado toast, which is apparently this big new thing now. Um, and so we actually have developed some of our own recipes for our avocado. So we actually have avocado with burrata and believe it or not, um, the, uh, what are the little seeds? They're like chia Pumpkin seeds. seeds. Oh, chia seeds. We put chia seeds on it. And then we also put the, um, what's the pomegranate? We mm. put pomegranate on it as well. And like, that's my new go-to kind of keto fun thing. Um, so I would say that I was never an avocado guy before, but I'm definitely an avocado person now. I actually ordered on sandwiches now and all that kind of stuff. So. Oh yeah, that sounds delicious. I'm actually going to dinner tonight. I'm going to make sure I get avocados. You inspired <laughs> me. What, uh, what's your favorite non-keto food? Ice cream. What flavor? So I'm a vanilla based guy, but I love peanut butter. So if you can give me vanilla with some Reese's cups in there, I'm good to go. <laughs> and I'm a Baskin and Robbins guy too. So like I'm old school. You know, like I go, I get one scoop of Reese's and one scoop of chocolate chip and that's, I'm solid. I have so many memories going to Baskin Robbins with my mom and dad. <laughs> right, with the pink spoon and everything, yeah, like it's totally. the best. Yeah. Um, what is the first thing you think of in the morning? So the very first thing I think of in the morning, so to be fair, we have uh, two animals, uh, actually three animals that all sleep in our bed. Um, and one of them is unfortunately quite ill. And so the very first thing I do is I look over to make sure like, my chihuahua is alive and breathing and okay. So my first concern is usually him. But if that's not the case, um, it's usually breath work and water um, and then sunlight exposure. So my first thing is I swing my legs over the side of the bed and I just breathe. You know, like sometimes you just have to have a space and time in your life to just chill and breathe. And so that kind of helps center me a little bit. So I do some Wim Hof breathing in the morning um, and I have a, a, a lukewarm bottle of water that's been sitting there at night, a uh, reusable bottle of water. And, um, and I down 16 to 20 ounces of water. And I usually do it, um, then I grab the dogs and we go outside. And while I'm walking them, and this is going to sound a little woo-woo, but I do it and I don't know why, but I really like it. I take my shoes off and I put my feet on the earth. Um, 
I don't have any science to back it up and I'm a total data guy. It just feels good um, to sit there with my feet on the earth and my dogs are walking around and I'm just breathing and there's no phone, there's no, there's no email, it's just like my space. And so that's really what I do in the mornings and it's, it's quite helpful. I love it. Yeah, you commented on my post about the grounding. You're like, I don't see the science, but I love doing it myself. <laughs> right. Uh, sorry to hear about your chihuahua. How, how, what's his name or what's her name? Sparky. It's his Sparky. name. How old yeah. is he? He's 11. He's 11. Um, but there's, he's supposed to, he should have lasted, he should last until 18, but he's had some uh, cardiac issues. Um, but we're, I mean, trust me, we, we basically run a nursing home here for our animals. We've got medicines and we've got therapies. We've got our own oxygen tank. Like we've got it all. <laughs> yeah, sending sending love to Sparky and the Thank rest. You. You're welcome. I have my dog sleeping right here. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever had? So this is going to sound interesting. Um, and it wasn't from somebody that I've ever met. So it was actually from a video that I watched um, with Will Smith. Um, and he said, fail forward. And I just, that's been one of the most important things that I've ever thought about is I want to fail fast and I want to fail forward, meaning I'm going to try a lot of different things and I want to figure out what doesn't work fast so I can push that to the side and continue forward. So, you know, when we started our conversation, even before we got on here, you're like, dude, you're out there and you're, you're on it. And I see your stuff all the time. That's because I fail forward. Um, and uh, if anybody gets the chance, you should just Google Will Smith fail forward and on YouTube. It's absolutely positively inspirational to just sort of see his thought process, because he's really one of the more successful, you know, entrepreneurs, actors, uh, influencers out there. And I think that's been a big thing for me is making sure that I have a really good relationship with failure, right? So when failure happens, I'm not downing myself. I'm not, I'm saying, great, what did I learn? How do I make this better? Let's go again. So I'd say that's the big thing for me. I love it. Are you okay to go two minutes over here? Yeah, of course. Uh, um, yeah, it reminds me of what, um, Bob Proctor, I studied Bob Proctor. I did his course over the weekend. He said, a rocket fails their way, its way to the moon. It, it just course corrects its way to the moon. Right. So that's what you're doing right now. I love yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. What's the worst advice you've ever had? Oh, uh, the worst advice I've ever had. Mm. Trust me, the check is in the mail. Um, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's been some of it. You know, I, I think, um, I don't really think I've gotten a lot of, terrible, terrible advice. I've had a lot of people tell me um, sleep's too hard to, to do in the digital space. I've had a lot of people tell me, um, you know, you're, the liability that you're putting yourself out there is too great. I've had people tell me, you know, the science changes too fast, um, on and on and on and on. You know, I, I don't mind the challenge. Um, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And um, I'm really confident that I think I can help people sleep better. I mean, dude, think about it. What if everybody out there had one good night of sleep? The same night, one night. Can you imagine what would happen in the world? It would be the coolest place ever, <laughs> right? Like we wouldn't have to worry politics, you know, trade wars, uh, you know, av flu, you know, everybody gets one really good night of sleep. Like just what would that do? I think it would course correct the world if we could do something like that. And that's kind of my mission. I love it. Yeah. Look at the opposite of that. Like the Super Bowl is coming up this Sunday here in Miami. Right. What's going to happen on a Monday, right? It's the opposite of that. It's a negative yes. effect. <laughs> Absolutely. If you, oh, actually, before I get to that question, what was your favorite TV show growing up? Oh, wow. My favorite, favorite TV show growing up. What did I have to watch? Well, I liked Friends for sure, but that was, I was older um, when that, like growing up, growing up, um, I was an A-team guy. For sure. I watched the A-Team every Thursday night. I loved Mr. T. I loved the whole thing. I thought that was really fun. Um, I liked, um, just to date myself, um, I liked Starsky and Hutch. That was a favorite. I'm 51. So um, that was certainly a, one of those shows that I really watched a lot of. Uh, but you know, it's funny, as I get older now, I'm more into documentaries. Like, I watched Game Changer. I watched like a couple of these like more health related, like Forks Not Knives, like all these different things. I'm not 100% plant based, just to be clear. I don't think anybody really probably should be, but that's <laughs> I love it. Yeah, right. Um, on. But um, I, I, you know, I really, I'm always up for learning something new. And just for a flat out like binge watch, um, I will admit to you, 
Entourage. Mm. That was my go-to. 96 episodes, dude. I watched every single one of them and they were awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, check out, if you haven't seen it already, the Chernobyl docuseries on HBO. I, you know, I've been, I, so I'm so close, but it looks so sad that I was just like, oh, I don't it, know. It, it is kind of sad and I typically don't like to watch that, but it's so good, man. It's one of the I best heard it documentaries. Was amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I recommend it. It's just so yeah. fascinating. So here's um, the crazy thing, but I've never seen an issue. I've never seen an episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know what? I've seen like, I've seen uh, one season. So I'm kind of with you on that one, even though I've heard amazing things about the rest of the show. But I know, I know. Oh, that is a good line. I, there's one line from that show that I did. Uh, somebody told me that I thought was really good. So going back to the favorite lines, the, the father is sitting there and he's about to go to war and his daughter is really upset because some guy did something to her. And he sits there and he's turning to his buddies and he says, he said, war is easy and daughters are difficult. And I was like, you nailed it, brother. <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> what, um, what about if you had one superpower, what would it be? You know, um, I feel like I do have a superpower, to be honest with you. I, what my superpower is, is I take incredibly complicated information and I bring it into bite-sized actionable pieces. And I think that's really what my superpower is. If I could do one thing, you know, flying would definitely be pretty cool, but I kind of like the idea of being invisible. I think mm. that could be fun. But if you have to choose just one, one power, I think the best one is probably speed. Because at, if you're the flash, right? You can go so fast that you can change time. You can do all this cool stuff. You can zip in, zip out. So I think I'm going with super speed. Awesome. I love it. What is uh, your favorite hobby at the moment? So I collect Hot Wheels cars. Um, so my son and I, I can't afford to collect real cars yet. Um, and my son and I are total car nuts. We go to car shows. We literally talk about cars almost every day. Um, it's just kind of our bonding thing. With my dad, it was baseball. With my son, it's cars. And um, we decided to start collecting Hot Wheels cars. And so I was born in 1968, which was the first year that Hot Wheels came out. And so what we do is we go to swap meets and trade shows where all the crazy collectible people are. And um, we buy only vintage 1968, so 52-year-old Hot Wheels toys that are in immaculate uh, you know, shape. And I've got a whole little thing over here on my side office where I've got all the Hot Wheels displayed. It's great. Super cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Dr. Michael Bruce, where's the best way for the keto campers to find your work? Oh, of course. So uh, I'm super easy to find on the internet. It's just thesleepdoctor.com. You'll never forget that. Um, check out Chrono Quiz. I think you'll really get a lot out of it. If you get an opportunity and you think it's worthwhile, check out the book. Um, I also have some sleep optimization courses on there. So uh, Ben, I'll, I'll talk with you about those. I think that might be something that your audience could find interesting, or maybe even you, maybe we'll get you to do the sleep optimization challenge and check you out. Yeah. And then you also have some, some blue light blocking glasses, the Lumineers, right? So yeah, I do. I'll, put, I'll put a link for that in the notes as well. And you're also Thanks. very active on Instagram. You've got a great Instagram. So I'll put your Instagram as well. Um, Do Dr. Michael Bruce, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for spending about an hour with us. Uh, I learned yeah. so much as I always do with you. And you do have that superpower, by the way, of taking complex difficult things to really explain to an average person and you break it down in a way that's not just easy, easy to understand, but it's a lot of fun to hear you speak. You've got great energy and enthusiasm. Thanks. And I love that about you, man. And I appreciate your work. And thank you so much for your time today. Dude, it was my pleasure. I'm happy to finally make it into the keto camp and talk to all the keto campers. Um, and I was serious. This is not going to be my only podcast with you. We'll do another one maybe in three to six months.